a national technical organization. And for those of you who are not members, we certainly solicit your membership. If you're interested in joining the AIAA, it's certainly got a lot of benefits for you as a professional. And please see myself or one of the other gentlemen uh, at the table here <clears throat> after the meeting and would certainly like to talk to you about membership. The uh, presentation we're having today, we're certainly honored to have here at White Sands Missile Range, and uh, we're looking forward to having that. Before we start, I'd like to introduce uh, the people we have here at the head table. And first of all, on the uh, far side there, and we'll just go around counterclockwise, uh, it's Jim Goodrich. Jim is uh, retired, but he's the uh, section, the Inland Missile Range AIAA section secretary, and has done a lot of work in getting this prepared for us. Next to him is Rob Tillett. Rob is, for the, most of you probably know Rob, but he's, uh, he works at the NASA uh, White Sands Test Facility. In fact, he's in charge of the White Sands Test Facility across the hill. Uh, next to him is Lynn Sugarman. Lynn is uh, formerly uh, Air Force, and some of you may have known him when he was uh, in charge of the Air Force activity here at White Sands. He's now over at the Physical Sciences Lab at NMSU, and he's assistant to the director there. Next to him is Joan Record. Joan is uh, the, is my boss's secretary, but she's also the lady that uh, did most of the work in getting this lunch and pull together, and s many of you probably talked to her on the phone, calling in your reservations. And next to her is our speaker that I'll be talking to you about now. He has uh, graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he's been involved with the aerospace industry for over 25 years. He spent five of those uh, years at Rocketdyne working on the engines for the Saturn V launch vehicle which first carried Americans to the moon. He also worked at uh, TRW on the lunar module descent engine and just as a matter of uh, reference we saw some places today where the lunar module descent engine was tested. For those of you who are not aware of it we did or the NASA did testing of the lunar module descent engine just over here across the hill at Rob Tillett's area. Since 1967 he's been working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. <clears throat> the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, for, for those of you not familiar with it, are, is um, really leading the, leading the effort for the United States in interplanetary exploration with spacecraft. And our speaker's been involved in a number of interplanetary spacecraft programs at JPL. He's been involved with the Mariner program, the Viking program, which of course we soft landed on Mars, and the Voyager Interplanetary Program. And the Voyager Program, of course, one of the Voyager spacecraft is going to be doing a uh, flyby encounter of the planet Uranus, uh, I believe in January of uh, 1986, coming up very shortly. So that should be very exciting. It'll be the first close-up look we have of that planet. The speaker is an author of over two dozen papers and articles, and he is uh, a distinguished lecturer of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. His current job is deputy manager of the Mars Sample Return Project. But his topic today is going to be something a little more far-reaching and I think a lot more exciting. And I'd like for you to join me in welcoming, welping, welcoming him to White Sands Missile Range today. Thank you, John, and thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and it was an unexpected pleasure to meets with some of my old friends from TRW who, with whom I worked on the uh, limb descent engine, what's getting to be more, more than a few years ago. I always have to start out my presentation with kind of a disclaimer that even though I work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and a lot of what I do has to do with Mars, what I'm going to talk to you about today has nothing to do with JPL. It represents some activities that were done on our own time, on our own money, and private, and so on. So it's not to be construed as any kind of, as anybody's policy except maybe mine and a few other zealots who are interested in going to Mars. The background of this, and I'm going to give you kind of an abbreviated version today because I know everybody has to go back to work. You get the, if you come to, to the version tonight, you get the longer winded edition with a little more detail. But in brief, the genesis of what I'm going to talk to you about came out of a couple of workshops or of, of uh, conferences that were held at the University of Colorado in Boulder in 1981 and 1983. They were called the Case for Mars, 
re reason for the name is the idea was to make a case for why we ought to be going to Mars. A uh, long time ago, back when we were working on Apollo, I figured that the next logical step was to go to Mars, and I spent a lot of years sulking because nobody else seemed to see it that way, or at least nobody in authority did. Um, Along about the early 80s, when the shuttle was starting to fly and all that, some of these folks at UC Boulder decided they were sort of fed up with this situation, and they decided to do something about it. Put on these conferences was what they decided to do, to bring Mars back into the focus of public and national attention. We had some workshops in conjunction with these where we dealt with the specific problems of how you would support a permanent base on Mars not just go to Mars and land, but a permanent base. The idea being if you're going to go all that distance and take all that time to get there, it made a lot more sense to remain for a substantial period as we've done in Antarctica. And nobody will argue, I think, that we've learned far more about the Antarctic continent since we've had permanent bases there than we ever did in the era of the heroic sorties to the pole and back where people were really just hanging on by their fingernails to survive and whatever science they did and so on had to take a back seat to just the simple fact of staying alive. So we thought that the logical thing to do to explore a world, and Mars really is a world, not just a place, was to go there and stay. Now if we're going to do that, and we, we wanted to use existing technology, things that had at least been demonstrated in the laboratory, we didn't want to depend on some Flash Gordon super space drive to get us there. We were going to do it with existing propulsion. We had to figure out how to do it without having to launch the national debt and propellants into Earth orbit every couple of years in order to support a resupply mission. Now, there are lots of ways that you could approach this problem and lots of solutions to it. I'm going to present you one scenario that we developed as out of these workshops to support a permanent base. And if I don't use your favorite technology, I, I apologize because, as I say, there's more than one way to do it. But our point was to demonstrate that we could establish and maintain a base on Mars. We don't need to wait for something completely new in the way of technology. We can do it with developments of what we've got today. So let's go on. There's, there's a picture of our target, so you'll know where we're headed for. And with that, let's go on to the next slide, John. The conventional approach, I hope all of you can see those better than I can with all the lights, but the conventional approach to going to Mars is to uh, send a big spacecraft and you put the whole thing into orbit around the planet, which you burn a lot of propellants to get into orbit. You send the lander down, usually with aerodynamic braking. Then you burn a lot of propellants to come back up from the surface, and your spacecraft then burns some more propellant at the proper time to get out of orbit and go back to Earth. Well, all that propellant that you're burning around Mars for getting into orbit, for descending, for coming back, if you have to bring all that from Earth, which is the, quote, conventional approach, then for every gram of propellant that you burn there, you had to spend about three grams of propellant getting it out of Earth orbit in the first place. If you're talking about a substantially large crew of people and enough equipment to establish a permanent facility, then you're talking about a total mass departing Earth orbit on the order of millions, tens of millions of tons, or, ten, um, you know, 20, or 20, 20, 20 million or, or so pounds of material. I, I said 20 million tons, I didn't mean that. Tw about, but 20 million pounds would not be unreasonable for if you had to carry all the propellant to support the scenario I'm going to present to you today. So our approach, among other things, was to try to come up with a scenario that would allow us to avoid the necessity for hauling all this propellant to Mars. So let's go to the next slide and I'll, I'll show you some of the approaches that we came up with. Now conventionally, a, a mission to Mars, you start out as is shown in the left hand of those two pictures there. A, you depart from Earth and you fly a approximately minimum energy trajectory and you arrive at Mars, and then you burn the propellant to go into orbit. <coughs> you wait at Mars for a period of months, depending on exactly what the opportunity is. Then you burn a more propellant to come home, and when you arrive back at Earth, then you go into orbit around Earth, or you enter the atmosphere, or whatever. One of the ways we decided we could avoid burning all this propellant 
is to not put the spacecraft into orbit around Mars at all, which leads us to the, to the right-hand slide. The, the travel to Mars would still be essentially the same as, as in the left-hand picture there <coughs> along a minimum energy trajectory, but the deep space habitat that the crew lives in during that mission doesn't go into orbit. It simply flies by Mars, does a small propulsion burn, and that puts it on a trajectory back to Earth. The crew, meanwhile, has entered some shuttle vehicles and gone on down to the surface. Now, the good news about this return orbit is that it comes back to the orbit of Earth uh, several months later. The bad news is that Earth is somewhere else at the time you arrive, because the solar system is not too well designed and nothing is quite synchronized, so you wind up arriving at Earth's orbit, but nobody's there. So you proceed around the sun one more time, and when you come back to Earth, Earth is there. Now the good news about that is it's relatively inexpensive in terms of propellant. You've got to do a little burn as you fly by Mars, but not much. The bad news is that it's a long way home, and that 18 months that it mentions on that, uh, on that chart there is highly optimistic. Many opportunities, it can easily be a year longer than that. Now that time coming home is not wasted because there's an awful lot of good science that can be done dur during, the, during that flight in support of astronomical and other types of investigations. But it is a long time for the, for the homeward bound crew. Next slide, please. The scenario outbound would go like this. You launch out of Earth orbit three individual spacecraft and the, the do you suppose anybody, everybody could hear me if I walked over there by the screen and pointed to it? Because that would make it a lot easier to explain. Well, let's give it a try. If not, I can come back over here. Oh, that's right. You can't. All right. Forget it. Use your imagination. Uh, you dock these three individual vehicles, which are, are identical, into the three-cornered pinwheel configuration that you see at the top of the chart there. And we spin that up to provide artificial gravity. The reason for that is that data to date do not un unequivocally indicate whether or not humans need gravity to survive in space. Certainly some of the Soviet data imply that there are some undesirable effects of long-term exposure. We figured as engineers that if we got to have gravity, it's easier to design in the capability from the beginning and then find out later we may not need it than it is to leave it out optimistically and then later on have somebody come along and say you've got to have artificial gravity and then figure out how to make that an added capability to a vehicle that wasn't designed for it. Hence we designed the, th the three-wheel three configuration there. The reason for three is that it gives us some redundancy. If one vehicle aborts leaving Earth orbit, the other two by jettisoning part of their adapter structure can dock into a dumbbell configuration and still complete the mission. All, th all three vehicles are capable of, of completing the mission by themselves, as a matter of fact, but one of them obviously couldn't by itself couldn't provide artificial gravity. But anyhow, the, because in the long run these are going to be resupply missions for an established base, it was very important to us to have redundancy to make sure we could get a mission off at every launch opportunity. Anyhow, arriving at Mars, the vehicle despins, the crew enters the Mars shuttlecraft, which I'll describe later and using aerodynamic braking, place themselves into orbit about Mars, do some final reconnaissance, and proceed to land. Meanwhile, the vehicle goes, uh, the deep space vehicle heads on back to Earth. Next slide, please. That just gives you a little more detail about the departure, showing the three identical vehicles departing on, each, on their three individual stages. Next slide, please. Now, what happens on a that, that first one was the, was the initial base establishment mission. What happens on a crew rotation mission? Well, it's identical up until the time the crew departs from the deep space habitat. Now that there's a base on the surface and there are existing uh, electronic stations down there that can provide guidance and navigation inputs and you know what the weather is, there's no point in going into orbit initially. So you would proceed on directly into a landing. You always have the possibility of going into orbit sort of as a, like a holding pattern when you're shooting an instrument approach in an airplane, but you don't have to unless there's some last minute glitch. And the deep space vehicle goes on by just as it did in the previous scenario. The difference is now the crew that's on Mars that has been there for a couple of years enters the shuttlecraft in which they arrived, 
and takes off and asserts themselves into orbit around Mars a couple of days ahead of time, and then at the appropriate time, place themselves on a rendezvous trajectory with the deep space habitat on the outbound leg headed, headed back for Earth. At this point, people usually cringe and say, you mean you're going to rendezvous out in deep space instead of orbit? The answer is yes, and it doesn't appear that that is a substantial risk. It, um, for the first couple of days, you still have the option of aborting back to Mars if you can't make the rendezvous, and at least you've got the base to go back to, um, unlike the guys on the moon who really didn't have any place to go if they couldn't get off the moon. And a deep space rendezvous is, in principle, no more difficult and, in fact, may well be easier than doing it in low Earth orbit or in low Mars orbit. So there seemed to be no real reason to, to avoid that kind of approach. Next slide. Coming back to Earth, the, uh, the vehicle does the last propulsion burn and places itself into a highly elliptical orbit around Earth. Highly elliptical because, again, that propellant had to be tanked in, into the vehicle from the beginning. You've had to haul it all the way to Mars and all the way back, so you want to burn as little as possible in order to minimize the mass. Hence, you go into a highly elliptical orbit, and then using a multi-pass aerobraking technique, you slowly circularize the orbit back down to space station altitude. Then you can disassemble the vehicle, refurbish the three parts, and prepare them for the next mission. The crew have the option of either riding into orbit with the deep space habitat, or if we can come up with adequately reusable heat shields, they can use the final stages of their shuttles to aerobrake directly down to the space station orbit. Next slide, please. That just gives you some idea of what the deep space habitat looks like. Um, five crew members live in each one of the habitats at the end of the arms. Those habitats are essentially based on uh, space station module structures. The big dishes that you see are collectors for solar thermal power generation system. Uh, inboard of that, you see what looks like a tank farm and a couple of engines. Those are the propellants for the various maneuvers that this vehicle has to do. The engines are, in essence, based upon Space Shuttle Ohm's engines. Um, beneath that, you see the cone-shaped vehicle, which is a Mars shuttlecraft. Its placement there is so that the crew cabin of the vehicle, as you'll see later, is more or less in the middle, is behind the, that assemblage of tanks to provide shelter from uh, solar flare radiation in case of, of a large flare. Since we came up with that design, it's been criticized by some solar physicists who say that solar flare radiation really is kind of isotropic. It comes from all directions and that you need a, a four pie shield all around the cabin. Others have stood up and declaimed just as loudly that that's a lot of baloney and it really is more or less radially outward from the sun. So I guess till the experts can make up their minds, I'll be inclined to leave the design the way it is. Next slide, please. That's just an artist concept and color of what the, what the vehicle might look like. It's despun there, and you see that the shuttles are in the process of separating on the approach to Mars. Next slide. Landing of the, of the shuttlecraft is pretty much the same scenario that we use for Viking. <coughs> you do aerodynamic braking down to some minimum airspeed. In the case of this particular aerodynamic shape, the minimum is about Mach 2 because it begins to become aerodynamically unstable at about that velocity. At that point, you'd pop the drogue chute to stabilize it, further decelerate it, then the main chute, manipulate the shroud lines rather like we did on the Gemini spacecraft to bring it to a proper attitude and you then use the rocket engines for final touchdown. Next slide, please. That shows the aerodynamic shape. It's chosen because for the aero capture uh, in the initial air capture maneuvers, we need a lift over drag capability somewhere in the range of 0.6 to 1.5. And that aerodynamic shape, depending on how it's trimmed at what angle of attack, will in fact deliver L over Ds in that range. Um, it may turn out that for accurate pinpoint landing that we need a higher lift over drag in order to be sure we can always land close to the base. So. In the long run, we may wind up going to some other aerodynamic configuration, but this was chosen initially because it appeared that the, that the nil over D of 1.5 would be adequate. I've redone the numbers a little bit since that slide was made, and it's got a little bit shorter down to about 20 meters and a little bit bigger across the back end by about a meter or so. 
that's too big to launch inside the space shuttle cargo bay, so it would be launched external uh, in place of the shuttle orbiter on the external tank and uh, an SRB stack, similar to the heavy lift launch vehicle configuration that you may be familiar with. In fact, we could launch two of them that way at the same time. Next slide, please. That's kind of, there's a lot of artist's license in this about what the innards of this machine look like, but there are two versions of this of the shuttle. There's a cargo vehicle, which is strictly a one-way machine. Each one of them land, is capable of landing 18 metric tons on the surface. Three of them, plus the cargo that's carried in the manned vehicle, is adequate to establish a base. We computed the, a mass requirement of about 75 metric tons to do that. As rocket engines and enough propellant for the landing, but, but no more. We chose to use the same aerodynamic shape for both of them simply to reduce the amount of development cost that is required. You've got all kinds of cargo volume in there unless there's a demand for ping pong balls on Mars. We're certainly not going to be vo volume limited for 18 tons, but that, uh, that turns out to be an advantage. It simplifies your packaging quite considerably. Uh, next slide, please. That's the people carrier version. The crew sits more or less in the middle. The reason for that is because of the, of the way this vehicle flies, one with, that, with the bend forward in, during the uh, air, aerodynamic phase and then, and then with the thrust uh, coming out of the tail in the normal rocket fashion for landing and takeoff. In order to keep the G-loads eyeballs in and eyeballs down on the crew, those chairs would have to swivel around, but anyway, Essentially, you sort of have to put them near the middle of the bird. Um, it's a two-stage vehicle because the uh, performance of the propellant combination is pretty poor. Uh, you notice, those of you who are familiar with chemical terminology, it says carbon monoxide and oxygen. Now, to my knowledge, no one's ever run a rocket engine on carbon monoxide and oxygen, and the performance is not especially good when you compare it with any of the conventional propellants. So why, you may ask, is this guy standing here saying we're going to waste our time with this lousy propellant? The reason is really simple. In order to minimize, again, the amount of mass departing Earth orbit, we want to be able to manufacture propellant for the return mission and any we may use on Mars for other purposes using Martian natural resources. The, may, the one resource that we know is readily available is the atmosphere, which is about 95% carbon dioxide. We have demonstrated uh, cells in the laboratory that will, that will uh, decompose carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide and oxygen. And the idea here is that it's a kind of propellant plant that you can simply set out on the surface and check, check it out and turn it on and leave it alone because they, all it's got to do is compress the atmosphere and operate on that. And it can sit there and make propellant while your crew is out doing other things. It would be much more desirable, if we could do it, to manufacture methane or methane and oxygen or hydrogen and oxygen. But to do either one of those, you need water. There's water in the atmosphere, but not enough to do any good. There's water frozen in the polar caps, but you probably don't want to go to the poles. And even if you did, mining ice at minus 100 uh, centigrade is uh, a pretty challenging prospect. It's awful hard. And there may well be water as permafrost beneath the surface. Permafrost is one of the most intractable materials known to man. It eats up drill bits, and if you stop drilling, it freezes the bit in the hole so you can't get it out and has other desirable traits like that. We figured if we made our people on Mars depend upon obtaining water under these conditions, we're going to be back in the Antarctic syndrome where they're going to spend their whole time there worrying about mining the water and not doing the things we wanted them to do. So we wanted a propellant combination that would allow us to simply set up the plant and essentially forget about it except you know, checking on it once in a while. The only one that met that criterion was the carbon monoxide and oxygen. Someday downstream, once the base is established, and if water is reasonably easy to obtain, especially if it's available in permafrost, then we would definitely go to the mode of synthesizing methane and oxygen out of water and CO2. But that's kind of, that, that would be the second generation. So you, you can look upon that as kind of the Model T version and the Model A might go to methane and oxygen. Next slide, please. <coughs> 
That gives you an idea of what the landing site might look like. There's a cruise shuttle in the foreground there, and it would remain just as you see it until it's refueled and takes off again. In the background, you see a couple of sh cargo shuttles being tipped over and hauled away to, uh, to become par part of the base habitat structure. Next slide, please. That just talks a little bit about the propellant uh, production capability. I guess the one thing I would mention is that there are gas, other gases in the atmosphere. There's uh, several percent of both argon and nitrogen, which are quite useful because you can't breathe pure oxygen for any period of time. We did it on Apollo, but that was a couple of weeks. If you start talking about breathing pure oxygen for months, there are some very undesirable physiological effects that take place. So you need a buffer gas. We use nitrogen on Earth because that's what's here, and nitrogen argon would work just as well. So uh, you could anticipate that the Mars base would have an atmosphere that use, uses uh, argon and nitrogen as a buffer gas, and that's readily available with the hundreds of tons of CO2 that we'd have to process to manufacture the uh, propellant we would have more than adequate supplies of both breathing oxygen and buffer gas from that source. Next slide, please. That's kind of an idea of what the base would look like in its very early phases. In the far background, you see the shuttlecraft out there. Between them and the, and the, and the base in the foreground, you see the one version of the atmosphere or the propellant manufacturing plant with its big in, inlet horn to the compressors and behind it, uh, the heat radiators for the waste heat and so on. In the near foreground, you see uh, two of the shuttlecraft that have been hauled over there and laid together and connected up to form uh, habitats. And, and then you see on either end of it some Quonset hut shaped structures, one of which will probably become a uh, greenhouse, which I'll talk about next, and the other one might be a pressurized uh, hangar or uh, workshop for working on surface vehicles and that sort of thing. You wouldn't necessarily have a breathable atmosphere in there, but if you could just pressurize it to the point where people could work without wearing spacesuits, even if they had to wear, wear breathing gear, any of you who've ever tried to do any work with go gloves on, to say nothing of spacesuit gloves, will appreciate how much easier it is to do mechanical work if you don't have to wear those things. Way off in the background is supposed to be the power plant for the base. After a lot of consideration, we could see no viable alternative to a nuclear power plant to provide the energy for a base of this type. Uh, solar panels would literally require acres of area and would be very difficult to deploy, be very inefficient. You'd have to constantly worry about dust uh, settling out on them and that sort of thing when, when the dust storms come, which they inevitably will, uh, then you'd lose a lot of power. So nuclear seemed to be the only real alternative. Uh, it's quite easy to get it there because the reactor is not terribly radioactive when it hasn't been operated. And then you can bur bury it in a suitably prepared area and use the Mars soil itself as shielding, thereby substantially reducing the mass. You see a cable running out across the ground there to it. I suspect that's a little artistic license because I wouldn't be inclined to leave a 100 kilowatt power cable on the surface. And in fact, in real life, the propellant manufacturing plant would probably be pretty much co-located with the power plant on account of the most of the uh, process is actually thermal rather than electrical, and you might just as well make use of the waste heat out of the reactor, which you're going to have lots of in any case, and save the electricity for other more productive purposes. There's a little figure about halfway in between. I assume. I've always said that that was probably a nuclear protester out there protesting running the power plant at full power. Uh, one other thing you see there is you notice we're burying the habitat using a dragline crane. The reason for that is simply that Mar Mars has very little magnetic field and a relatively thin atmosphere. And the combination does not provide adequate shelter against solar flare radiation. Certainly not a, nothing like what we have on Earth. So most of the time, you would like the crew to be protected from the radiation. The easiest way to accomplish that is simply to pile up a meter or so of soil o over the habitats. And we chose a dragline crane as the simplest, cheapest, and easiest way to do that. One of our standing jokes is if this ever became a NASA project, they'd probably spend a billion or so dollars developing a Mars steam shovel to do the same thing. But since this wasn't a government project, we could go cheap. <laughs> 
Next slide, please. That's the early version of the greenhouse, which is nothing more than an inflatable plastic structure. And I, I like to emphasize the greenhouse a little bit because I think it's important from a lot of respects. Um, one is simply the fact that you can grow a great deal of food in a greenhouse of this type. And that's going to be important because these people are going to be on Mars for a long time, literally years. And you can get very tired of freeze-dried food, usually about halfway through the first meal. So uh, I think it's very important that we be able, both for, for physical and, and mental health, if you will, to be able to grow a lot of our own fresh food. And also, of course, it supplements the, uh, the uh, life support system by converting CO, CO2 back into oxygen. By using hydroponic and aeroponic techniques, which have been very well developed on Earth, uh, you can get tremendous yields out of a uh, relatively small growing area in a greenhouse and it can essentially grow year round. So a relatively small area like this could provide more than adequate food supplies of, of at least vegetables and, and some fruits for a base of this size. You see down in the corner there we've got a fish pond and since not everybody is a vegetarian we'd have to provide some other forms of food. Fish farming is very efficient and, in, and er, both in terms of area and, and protein content. So certainly we could raise fish. It would probably be, they could probably do some pretty spectacular jumps in 40% gravity too, as it shows there. It all, also would be quite feasible to uh, raise, probably raise other small meat animals such as chickens or rabbits. It'd be a while, I think, before we could get up to beefsteak, unfortunately. Um, I think another thing that perhaps we engineers tend to overlook a lot, but I think it's very important, is the aesthetic value of something like this. Uh, we, we always tend to think that we'll, we'll have these dedicated crews that'll never get lonesome for Earth because they're so wrapped up in what they're doing, but I think we're a little optimistic and certainly experience in the Soviet long-term missions and even some of our own missions indicate that. I think the fact that you can have a place where there are green growing things that people can walk around in. The fact that you can grow things like flowers and just and have all the fresh fruits and all like that, I think is going to be a very important morale factor for the crew. And again, that's some, something we tend to overlook a lot. And you can get away with it on short missions. I don't think you can get away with it when the crew is going to be gone from home four or five years. So I think the greenhouse is going to be very important for, from a lot of respects. Now this, this early one being just an inflatable plastic structure is not going to last very long in the Martian environment. The ultraviolet will certainly start to get to the plastic, but it would serve as an interim structure until using Martian materials you could uh, develop a real a permanent greenhouse structure, probably partially buried, but, uh, but still s similar in, in overall configuration to what you see there. Next slide, please. Okay, well, there, there's, there is the uh, real estate that, that I'm peddling today. Now, a lot of people say that's a pretty, pretty barren and pretty forbidding place, although actually I've seen some stuff with real estate signs on it out in the Mojave Desert that didn't look a whole lot worse than that. Uh, but there are some things to, some thoughts I'd like to leave you with there, and I've just skimmed over it very quickly today. One of the important things there is to notice that unlike the pictures that came back from the moon, the sky isn't black. There's an atmosphere there. The sky isn't blue either. That's because there's a lot of dirt or dust suspended in the atmosphere just about all the time. It sort of gives it that sort of pinkish color. For those of us who live in Los Angeles, that's perfectly normal, so we wouldn't think <laughs> twice about it. But the point is there is an atmosphere which allows us to use it for landing, to use it for a life support system. Within that soil, and if we're right about the permafrost and so on, beneath the surface of that soil, in, co in conjunction with the atmosphere, is everything we need to make a base on Mars independent of Earth for, every, for all the major bulk consumable materials that it takes to sustain life. Clearly, we'd still need the high-tech manufactured goods that Earth can provide. But we don't need to haul every bite of food we eat and every, every glass of water we drink to Mars. It can sustain indefinitely a permanent human presence with the technology that we know how to do today. That's not to say there isn't some major engineering to be done, 
but we don't require any new breakthroughs. We don't require something, some way out technology that nobody ever heard of. We know how to do it. I think what we lack is the will to do it, or what we've lacked so far. And I sincerely hope that, I, that we see that change. Next slide, please. And that someday, rather than his, one of his robot emissaries such as took this picture, a human being can stand on the surface of Mars and watch the sunset. Thank you. I will stay and answer questions as long as anybody wants to ask them or until John drags me away to whatever it is we've got to do next. So if you've got questions, why fire away. Yes, sir. It's been proposed from my reading there that the thing to do is send the robot that 